welcome to Oshkosh, Troy. Thank you. <laughs> that was a beautiful trip. We've got airplanes. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like there's a view. Does it set to be an angel? Where does the sun go when it sleeps? Okay, everybody. Here is episode 18 of the student pilot cast. And this is part two of Potapalooza 2008 from the showgrounds at EAA Air Venture in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. I hope you enjoy. All right, folks, welcome back to Potapalooza 2008 live on EAA radio and in the forum number four at the Honda Forums Plaza, the AirBP forum. We're going to start uh, bringing the crowd in here. So I'm going to turn this over to Jack Hodgson, who is our, uh, a roving guy in the crowd from uncontrolled airspace. Jack Hodgson, Thank you. everyone. So, so we really do want to know what you, because some of us haven't had a chance to get around too much, so we'd like to hear a little bit about what you're, you've been seeing here this week. Right, right so, back. so I see the one in the back, but I'm going to start with the cat lady. I want, I'm sorry, I want to start with the cat lady here. What, what's your first name? Nina. And where are you from? Uh, Sebastopol, California. Ah, okay. What have you seen here this week that you like? Well, I love the Osprey. I agree with you. That was just the most unique thing I've ever seen. It was fantastic. I also thought that that little mosquito um, helicopter was interesting. It kind of disappears, and all you see is a body in a seated position flying around. I'm not familiar with that one. Any of you guys know what? Know that one? No. Is it in the ultralight? Oh yeah, yeah. It came out here with air creep. Oh, the one that it's white and it's just got a frame and. It seems, it looks to me to have no no skin whatsoever. It's just a right. It's a, the, the, it comes in two versions, and you get an enclosed cockpit in the second version, but you also have to have the floats for the seaplane allowance on the ultralight rule. So the one with no cockpit is part one hundred three legal. The one with floats is part one hundred three legal, but because of the extra weight allowance, they can afford the weight to actually put a cabin around it. <laughs> So is this is this the one the, the single seater that I saw kind of sitting right there next to the kind of the east end of the ultralight area? I, I if you're thinking of the one that had the star spangled paint job, because it's very pretty. That's not the one though. This one is just really bare bones, and I'd just okay. never seen anything like yeah, it. Yeah, I think that's. The but one. the most popular craft out there in the ultralight area is Air Creations Tanarg. There's a, uh, a two-seater, and man, people are just lining up to take a spin around the pattern in that. We you can't even keep up with them. <laughs> Very That's cool. great. Thank you. Um, it's always well, nice to know somebody's going down to the farm there and actually coming back with something. Yeah. So I'm curious. Anyone here in town for your first Oshkosh ever? Here we go. Oh, wow. That's great. Yeah, welcome to, welcome to Oshkosh. So, uh, what's your first name and where are you from? Uh, I'm Randy, and this is my son, Aaron. We're from Tampa, Florida, and this is our first trip, and it's just, it's, it's just amazing and overwhelming. What, anything, what in particular have you seen? The first few years you come to Oshkosh, you certainly are tuned into the airplanes and the events and that kind of thing. The people thing comes a little bit later on. What kind of airplanes and events have you seen that you particularly like? Uh, well, I saw the, uh, the Icon, which uh, we spent about an hour over there. They had to peel me away from that. That's, that's really, really cool. Uh, probably the most interesting thing, about 2 o'clock this afternoon, we were at the uh, sea base, and there was a water spout on the, uh, oh. on the lake. They were uh, getting everybody out of the way and bringing them back. So oh. there was that on the schedule, or did it just happen? No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah that, there, was, say, there was some weather that um, moved through the area. Um, I'm going to the seaplane moved base on either year, side man. of Oshkosh, thank you. That, that is That's, so sweet. In, you got to bring weather now into this. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I mean, I, I was, everyone else has been saying what a beautiful week it's been, but... Water spots. That's that's different. Who else was first timer here? You're a first timer. What, what your first name and where you're from? My name is Troy. I'm from Fort Worth, Texas. And what do you think? It's amazing. Um, most interesting thing, thing I've seen when wandering around uh, through the Warbird area. You can go to any show, any air show, and see one or two uh, Mustangs, P51 Mustangs. And you come here and you see ten taxi past you, twelve taxi past you. I counted them. Walk through the Warbird area, and there was another twelve parked there. So you only see that at Oshkosh. Yeah, great stuff. One yeah, more right. first timer, Jack. Both. Jack, yes. just a second you, you, here. I'd I'd like you to get. Uh, I flew Troy in because both Troy and Bill actually. I, I decided both of these guys. It's their first time at Oshkosh, and I wanted to make sure they got the full Oshkosh experience. What did you think of the arrival? Oh, that was amazing. Yeah, <laughs> uh, precise. 
Uh, <laughs> and the controllers at Fist do a fantastic job. Um, and uh, nobody can rock the wings of the airplane quite like Pilot Kent. And the controllers <laughs> remarked on that as well. Someday, someday, I would really like to own that Globe Swift I've talked about a couple times <laughs> and uh, get a low altitude aerobatic waiver just so that when I get to Fisk and they tell me to rock my wings, I can go all the way around. <laughs> were, were you reaching out the six sack that was going on there or what? We, I, we should also, you mentioned the controllers, they are doing an absolutely excellent job. I have tried to find some who have been here for a while, but every single one I've run into so far has told me they're a rookie controller because I've been asking um, if they're noticing more people this year that aren't reading the notum. Um, today was actually pretty good. Uh, Tuesday was not. I would guess half the people that were coming in on that arrival were asking questions, talking on the radio, not doing the right thing. So those controllers are, are being so patient and helpful, and they are awesome. So thank you to all those folks in the pink shirts. If you see them out there on the grounds, thank them, because they're doing an absolutely wonderful job. Two, Two of my favorite lines about flying the procedure in here. Um, one I just heard today, I was interviewing a guy who was a first-timer into, into Oshkosh, and I said, so what would you think of the procedure? And he said, well, you know, it really wasn't that much, that big a deal. And um, I was flying along, and I hardly saw any airplanes until I got to Ripon. And then it was like I was in a swarm of bees, he said, because there's a lot of airplanes out there. The other is a friend of mine said that, uh, that once you turn final at Oshkosh, every pilot bone in your body screams, go around. <laughs> Jack, That's definitely true. Jack, you know, we all know what's been happening with fuel prices. There was a lot of concern before the show about how many people would make it, how many would decide they couldn't. I'm curious what it is that makes people decide, yeah, I'm coming this year. I'm going to finally do it. How many people actually flew in in their own airplane or in an airplane, a small airplane? Did anybody, did anybody come close to not coming because of fuel? I mean, what, what do you feel about fuel prices? I was saying the fuel prices is not that much of the overall cost. I mean, that's it is true. More, of course, but it's that's not true. that much. It's incrementally a lot greater than it was, but in, in the overall scheme of things, it's it's not that big a deal. Let, let me add to the uh, uh, when you turn final at Oshkosh, the thought that goes through my mind is, please, Lord, don't let me screw this up. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of people watching. That's why so many people come the weekend before the show. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I. Nobody's I, I, watching. That, that hurt. I, that, that hurt. On, on Tuesday, that, when, when Bill and I were flying in, I, I landed right on the orange dot, and then I landed again about 50 feet later. <laughs> Was the orange dot what you were supposed to hit? Yeah. I, we'll fix that in editing, Ken. I'll tell you just the first part. <laughs> yeah, and you're here for the first time as well, right? Your, your name and your, where you're from. Hazel Jopling, my husband and I, John Jopling, are here from Maryland, selling our book, John the Airport Kid. And uh, John has introduced me to the world of aviation. I knew nothing about it before I met John, and this is my first time here. And what excites me, and I'm so pleased to see, is families interacting and having a wonderful time. The relationships, I've seen grandmothers with their grandchildren and uh, sons, of course, and there, there's so much to see for everybody, and you just feel so safe here, and the people are wonderful. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And Steve, Steve true. you bring your son here, right? You, you know, there's no danger of a, of a kid getting bored around yeah, here, is there? Where is he? By the yeah, Cole, he's, he's right out and this also, I, I thought it might sound a little pedestrian or, uh, or forced if I, if I said it, but the, the fact of the matter is that the coolest thing for me at Oshkosh is a six and a half year old, former five and a half year old, if you'll remember from last year, um, out there. Uh, my son Nicholas, um, he's he's not quite sure he's at Oshkosh. He's not been through a thunderstorm yet. <laughs> but no, he's he's. We've been camping for the last two three days, and you know it gets a little boring sometimes if I gotta you know sit there and do blog posts or so. Or you know he, he doesn't quite understand that you don't get to talk to a Raptor pilot every day. And the but the cool thing is. He's a kid growing up, understanding that when you leave the house with dad on a Saturday morning, one of the things that might happen to you is you'll find yourself ramp flying a Cessna or, you know, getting someplace on the ramp that most people don't get to go. It's all normal to him. But that all our kids thought that was normal. We would be a better people. 
Yeah, exactly right. Take experience. your kids to the airport. That's right. A lot. Okay. Another. Well, take your friends to the airport, too. Hi, I'm John from Rhode Island. Uh, this morning at 1030, they had Aeroshale Square filled with women pilots. And that was a, a th I didn't see it, but uh, somebody I know was there and she said they absolutely filled the whole place. And I think that's pretty cool. The yeah, biggest yeah. gathering of women's pilots ever. Yeah. Does anybody yeah. know, did they, get the, did they get the record they were looking for? They recorded them all in a logbook. Yeah. Before they got their pink shirt, they had to all that. They haven't tallied it up yet. Okay, so but, Guinness has documentation. And, and they're still counting also. I think they have until uh, midnight Sunday and, uh, and to the, get reg people registered in the logbook. Another I, was, I was there. They had uh, easily four or 500 women. Yeah. What uh, is the record that they're looking for? I don't think there is a record yet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's yeah. about four or yeah, five hundred. This, this would be the first one. Another notable thing, I believe, all the performers in the air show today before the Warbirds took out were all women, and that was really that was really cool. I thought, and and man, also from a flight instructor standpoint, they can outfly us guys. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know the, um, the the family thing reminded me that one of the things I forgot to say about the people. Take a look out here. You see a single piece of trash on these grounds? <laughs> and this is probably the one place in the world where I can leave a $1,000 video camera and a $500 cell phone and a $2,000 laptop sitting outside the shower building plugged in charging and not even worry about whether they're going to be there when, when I get back. Where, where, where shower are you taking building your shower <laughs> I, I actually did that today. I left a very expensive camera just sitting out uh, near where the buses are and rode all the way in and realized I didn't have my camera with me and went back and there it was. I want to go to the other end of the spectrum here. I want to try and figure out who has been to Oshkosh the most times here. Has there anyone been to Oshkosh more than 20 times, more than 20 years? Yep, right there. Oh, all right. That was easy. How, how uh, for your name and where you're from? Uh, Roger Bishop from Indianapolis, and this is my 30th year. 30, wow. yeah, all right. What, what do you remember about those earliest times you were here? The thing I remember is every single time you come, there's something new, something historic. And for me, it was something simple this year. Last, or yesterday, the U2 taxied up and taxied nose right up to the crowd, and the guys got out in their spacesuits, and you just don't see that anywhere else, even if you were <laughs> close to the base. So, uh, but I came out in 1978 with a, with a home built. We did as a high school project, and that was my uh, first time to come to Oshkosh, and I've only missed a couple since. That's great. I've got a question. I'm wondering who took the longest to fly here. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Who... <laughs> All right. That's right. You're from Oregon, right? And how did you get here? Yeah, it's a long way from Oregon and a champ. The mountains are beautiful. The coast is beautiful, but Montana's really, really big. <laughs> but the, the greatest thrill of all, I think, was, was I come in on runway 36. I taxi back down to the end of it, put up my tent. Two days later, John Travolta comes in just like I did. It was really <laughs> Just like you did with a lot more gas. You didn't tell us your, you didn't tell us your name and where you're from. Yeah. I'm Richard Holdham from Oregon. So are, are you going are you going back to Oregon? Yeah, are you gonna take the champ back? Uh, via actually I'm meeting my, my wife in upstate New York. I'm gonna fly to Maine, visit some friends, and my wife's at home collecting rent today and she will be again before I can fly home. <laughs> okay. Here here's the thing. Um the, the podcasters uh, uh, um the Rod Rakick, who is, uh, has appeared on several of our shows, um, uh, Captain Civil Air Patrol, and in other capacities, he's been on my show a couple of times, has uh, begun a new social media site. I'll plug it just very quickly. It's called MyTransponder.com. Still in beta. It's like Facebook for, for pilots. Only Facebook could not do pilots like pilots can do pilots. This, I heard somewhere about downwind duck. I'm not sure that this is true or whatnot. Stuffed duck with a logbook rubber banded to him. The idea was to take downwind with you, fly him, make a logbook entry. If you're a CFI and he's got enough time, give him an endorsement. If he goes on your check ride with you, you, uh, you give him the rating. This is Ace, the, the mascot of the first social media site uh, specifically for pilots. We're going to send this with you. The important thing to do is to take this, um, the idea... 
fly in as many different kinds of aircraft, different kinds of circumstances, by as many different kinds of people as possible. And so what we wanted to do is we figure you're probably going to be flying the most or the longest or the furthest away from here. Please take Ace on his inaugural flight, do a logbook endorsement, but most importantly, pass Ace on. Great. All right. Yeah, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about Rod's new site here as soon as we come back. You are listening to Potapalooza 2008 on Woo! EAA Radio. Yay! All right, welcome back once again to Potapalooza 2008 live on EAA Radio and in forum number four at the Honda Forums Plaza. As we mentioned a moment ago, uh, we're going to talk a little more with our friend Rod Rakick here, who has started a really neat new site for pilots. So take it away, Jack. Rod, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, my transponder and what you're going for? Actually, if you'll allow me, tell us which podcast you've been on so far. Uh, wow. Uh, I've been really lucky. I've uh, been honored to be on a number of the podcasts. Uh, I started, I believe it was uh, with uh, the pilot cast. Uh, back when uh, they wanted to talk to someone about the Civil Air Patrol, and I was, I've was i been blogging about uh, my experience flying for CAP for uh, the last four and a half years now. So I had a chance to, uh, to talk about that. And then I believe the next time I was on a podcast was with Jason on the Finer Points, and we had a great conversation about uh, how pilots can uh, get found and, and increase their chances of... Uh, of uh, being located after an off-airport landing, uh, then with airspeed uh, a couple of times, and, and it's been a ball working with Steve because not only has he uh, interviewed me about things in, in aviation, but I actually got a chance to uh, turn the mic around recently and kind of debrief him uh, along with everyone uh, about his flight with the, uh, the Air Force Thunderbirds. So I've had a great experience. I don't have a podcast of my own. Uh, because other than maybe Tony Condon, uh, I've, I've, I've been on a, a lot of other people's uh, uh, dime. So uh, uh, some of my friends here talk about flying OPA, other people's airplanes. I, I, I get to, to uh, hang out on other people's podcasts. You know, that just proves that you're smarter than the rest of us are. <laughs> here, here. Rod, Rod, Rod gets to look. sign off and go to bed. We edit. <laughs> so tell us about my transponder. Well, my transponder is a social network for aviation, so it's pretty easy to explain to people when you say it's, it's Facebook for pilots. It's a way for us as a community to connect with each other, uh, more easily find all the other pilots that are on the network that happen to fly uh, from your home base or maybe fly from the uh, airport that you're about to go fly into for the first time and, or maybe the uh, airframe that you particularly fly and trade that tribal knowledge that helps us all uh, be safer, be uh, able to have more fun, and, uh, and, and make that easy, uh, not only for us in the community, but also to uh, allow folks that maybe aren't in the community yet to connect with the, w with the folks that uh, want to share their passion for aviation. Great. Very cool. So, very cool. And, and while the while the site is in beta right now, I think there's an Oshkosh special, right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> like like everything here, there's a there's a show special. Uh, just go to uh, www.mytransponder.com. You can uh, click the link there that fills out a little form and uh, request an invite. We're at, we're beta, which means we're invite only. Uh, we're just trying to get it right, but we also need that community to uh, help us. Uh, understand what everyone needs and, and make the site as best we can. Uh, so anyone who would like to uh, send that email or fill out that form, uh, we'll, we'll get you an invitation to access the site as soon as we can. And I, I believe Rod does that uh, manually himself, so let's keep him busy. <laughs> During the break, I was talking with this gentleman. You apparently were attending the EAA convention back before it came to Oshkosh, when it was in Rockford, Illinois, right? Yeah. Um, that was, uh, I was very young at the time. No, actually, I, I'm sorry. My name is Rob Mark, and uh, I'm also a blogger, but I, I wasn't a blogger then. I mean, blogging hadn't been invented back in 1964, so it was a lot of fun. Tell us about Rockford. What was that like back then? Oh, well, in fact, I was, I was lucky enough, at, well, for anybody that is from the Midwest, saying you're going to spend your summer in Rockford doesn't sound like a lot of fun. I thought it was cool. 
because I got to go to the first EAA event in 64. And, and I was one of these guys with the paddles and helped flag the airplanes down. And at 12 years old, I just thought that was the cool. I tell all my friends that I go on vacation to Oshkosh, Wisconsin every summer, and they, they kind of look at me funny. So, oh. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but uh, so Rockford, was it very big? Uh, well, Rockford is, is not nearly as big as, as uh, Oshkosh is what. Oh, it was, there was every, every ounce of grass was covered. It was, and, and no one thought it could possibly get any bigger. And here we are, and it's way bigger. Did they have the same kind of representation from like military and big commercial airplanes? Well, now you're asking me to go back in, in time. Uh, you know, I, you know I, I don't know. I, I remember a lot of military. I don't think there was as much commercial then. Uh, the military was, was much more involved in the show then. So, but it was pretty cool then, too. Great. That's great. You know, I uh, was just going to ask, how long has it been in Oshkosh? We were talking about that today. We couldn't remember when it moved up here. About, I don't know if it's, I don't think it's 30 years. It's, I think it's moved, moved, moved here in 1970. Yeah, 1970, at the invitation of a, a little gentleman that used to manage the airport named Steve Whitman, <laughs> who'd been a championship air racer prior to that. Uh, he b- became friends with Paul Poveresne. Paul and the EAA board wanted to uh, take the show, take the, the convention, and they, they called it a convention in those days, to the next level. Rockford really wasn't sure that it wanted to uh, see it go that far. Uh, Steve Whitman had the support of the city fathers here. They even moved the tower to where it is, the old tower to where it is, to help accommodate that. They've expanded the runway twice over the years. It, it, it's all Steve's fault. Well, one of the things that we were I, we were talking about the the history of this, and uh, I realized when we did that, and this is after I went and picked up both these guys at Timmerman Airport, which is actually where the original EAA convention was, and uh, so that's that's kind of how we got on the subject. Yeah, in case well, anybody's counting, this is number fifty six. It, wow. it hasn't been played up like in years past, but from nineteen fifty three in Milwaukee to Rockford to here. It's been a 56-year journey. This gentleman is one of my heroes because, I've said this on the podcast, because he, he owns his own airport. Not simply a strip in his backyard, he owns an airport. Tell us about your, your, your name and where you're from. Hi, I'm Jim. I'm from uh, Philadelphia. And I want to say that one of the big highlights for me coming to AirVenture, and you, this shows you how boring my life is, is this event every year. So there you go. That, that is pretty scary. Yeah. <laughs> and before I tell you about this airport, which is an interesting thing, I, I do want to mention about what was meaningful to me here at the show this year, okay? Uh, we do talk a lot about how to get people interested and involved in aviation. And with all respect to, to Steve's great writing about the thrill of aviation, we do want to get people into aviation who are not necessarily have a love of aviation, but maybe find it useful. And... So occasionally we don't look for the Eclipse jets. We look for things that may be useful for people in aviation. And there's a plane out there that got a type certificate this week called an Expedition. It's made in Canada. And it won't get all the press that the Cirrus GTS-X will. But this is a sport utility vehicle airplane that you can put your bicycles and scooters and your you know, kids and luggage in and actually use the thing. So something to think about. Um, So one of the reasons that my wife and I found aviation useful, I I did not have the love of aviation as a kid. I I got a plane because we wanted to go places, and it's a hell of a lot more fun than driving. Um, And, well, if you're going to go into a beautiful area in uh, in the mountains, it might be helpful if you just kind of buy some property with a runway on it. And so we bought uh, an airport. But it's not an airport in the sense that... um, you know, we don't have a terminal. We don't sell fuel. We bought a private home that has a runway. There are runway communities, and I think everybody pretty much knows what those look like. But in the lesser populated areas of the world, there are thousands of homes that have their own runways. Some of them are registered, some of them not. This one happens to be registered. It, it does help preserve your rights when the community wants to come after you about the noise you're making landing and taking off in your backyard. It helps if you're registered. But that's probably a subject for another forum discussion. But it, it's very interesting. If anybody has any questions. Uh, yeah, where is it? It is a, in Albany, New Hampshire. It's near Conway and North Conway, New Hampshire, at the 
transition from what is called the Lakes District of New Hampshire, Lake Squam, Squam Lake and Lake Winnipesaukee, into the foothills of the White Mountains, which are a beautiful area to be in in the summer. It's New Hampshire's recreational area. And it's, it's close to Jack's heart because he lives up there. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's on the chart, but it's private now. Is that correct? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's, uh, it is it's 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 charted, and you'll see it. It's called Levitt, named after the guy who built it. And you'll see a lot of these, and you wonder when you look at these charts, if you're pilots, you see all these little circles with an R next to it in someone's name, or maybe not, maybe just a, a notation in an R. Why are they charted, and whose are they? They're charted if they're visible, if they're, especially if they're paid. If they're very visible, they chart them because they're good landmarks. They also chart them because they're emergency strips. Although you, you typically need the owner's permission to land somewhere, if it's an emergency, anybody's private runway is fair game, including mine. Um, they're also charted so that the owners can get on the map and use them as waypoints and find their own airports. So there's a number of reasons why they're on there. Does it? So what are your plans and or your dreams for this airport? It's kind of a whim when we started, but our... <laughs> our, our at least at this point, our plan is to build a new home, adjoin, replace the existing home with a new, newly constructed home, and turn it into a pilot fly-in rental home, since it's in a vacation area. Rent the house. I mean, I'm not giving you an advertisement. We don't even have the construction started. But someday the plug will be fly-in, rent the home for a week or a weekend. There'll be a hangar to store your plane. We'll leave a car there for you. And uh, it would just be a great thing if, if things like this were dotted around the country. And I, I have to ask a question. There's a strip west of O'Hare, which is on the chart. In fact, I looked it up once. And, I, and I've heard the story of this that, uh, you know, the, the owner uh, has a strip on his land and, and used to invite friends to come by all the time until one had an accident. And it decided, of course, the widow or the family decided to sue him. So how do you, I mean, is it, if, if it's a private airport or even as you go public, you, you get to be concerned about liability. I mean, and, and in this case, if the party says nobody comes here anymore, nobody can land here other than me, they close it off. That kind of thing got concern to you? I, I got most of that. There was a jet going by. Um, but it's a, it's a liability question, and it's like anything else. And the first thing you do when you go to register here for a campsite is the EAA has you sign that form, you know, absolving them of everything. And I do that with the, with the handful of people who have asked me for permission to land there. It's a, it's a short, narrow runway is right it's personal and private so yeah i ask them to sign their life away to me beyond that that's all you can do is you 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 you, you if you want to have people participate they sign their lives away on a release form and you go from there and you take your best shot of course even with the form you have no guarantee they won't you know you record anyway yeah lawyers are, the, are lawyers yeah. right when, steve when they design <laughs> yeah. i've i've long wanted to draft what we really mean by the disclaimers, it's just that if it ever got in front of, of a jury of, uh, of average folks, it just wouldn't be taken in the light I would intend. But, um, yeah, you, you're right. I mean, you know, plaintiff lawyers are plaintiff lawyers. I'm, I prefer to work for the largely defense and transactional firm I work for. But, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's rough. It's in, you know, sometimes like the General Aviation uh, Revitalization Act. Uh, that it took to actually get new production general aviation airplanes to come out. Unfortunately, we, I don't think we have quite the, uh, the, infra the legal infrastructure that we might otherwise have to support the, the, the kinds of activities that you've got going on. I mean, you know, you don't have to listen to Phil Boyer or me or anybody else to know that, you know, the nation's airports are a treasure. So anyway, that's, I agree. Who else has something I want to tell us about? That something really cool? That, where, where's their hand? There we go. Thank you. What's your name and where are you from? My name's Rick McClellan. These are my two sons, Daniel and Mitchell. And uh, first of all, I'd like to say thanks to all you guys because I, I listen to your stuff all the time and it's really great. It, I, you know, it helped me kind of extend Oshkosh for the rest of the year for me. You know? So I really appreciate what all you guys do. Thanks. And, uh, but the coolest thing for me, and it's the family thing, like Steve was, was saying, you know, we've been, we got here last Friday. We've been here for seven days and we've been camping in the North 40. And, uh, we just had a great time. We, we think we've seen just about everything there is to see at Oshkosh, and uh, you know we're going to do it again next year as long as we can. It's uh, it's a bonding thing. You know, both these guys are going off to college. It's going to be 
a little lonesome without him. So we're having this week together. It's really great. So really appreciate it. That's great. That's great. Welcome. Anybody else? Oh, here we go. What's your name and where you're from? I'm Jonathan from Cincinnati. And uh, first, I'd like to thank EAA this year for after torrential downpours, keeping the grounds from not like another fly-in I was at earlier in April down in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> um, two things. One, I'd like to know Dave or Jeb's opinion on the um, – changing leadership at Eclipse, I found it somewhat refreshing that a general aviation company who has not has yet to make money says, hey, maybe we should change something so that we can make money as opposed to the other side of the coin, i.e. airline. Second, I'm very sad to see the old towers not being made into a museum or a lookout area because that's Oshkosh. Yeah, Absolutely. I named the episode, while well, they're passing a the microphone around, the, the, the name of the episode we did a couple days ago, I called Jack Wants a Brick. This is my campaign is I want a brick from the building. Jeb gave me this idea. He wants a brick, too. I, I definitely want a brick, and uh, we're not finished with that project. Uh, but, Jonathan, uh, to answer your question about uh, Eclipse, um, I think it was something that was an inevitable. Um, anybody who'd been paying much attention to the company and, and kind of peeling the onion behind uh, what was going on, talking to some of the owners, talking to some of the employees, um, realized that they were in an unsustainable cycle. And um, I think, obviously, the Eclipse board finally came to that conclusion also. The, the most interesting thing about that entire episode was the public, uh, very public way in which uh, Vern Rayburn uh, was was kind of cast aside, for lack of a better word. Um, it, it, it it's almost unheard of, and uh, uh, you know they they clearly the, the new management, shall we say, clearly wanted to make send a signal uh, to prospective investors. They obviously had a uh, uh, supposedly anyway stated requirement that Mr. Rayburn not be in charge to obtain the next round of their funding. Uh, they obviously sent that message loud and clear. Um, they've got a good airplane by all uh, accounts, those who have flown them, and uh, everybody hopes they make a go of it. Um, they're not, they can't even see the edge of the woods yet. David, hold that thought. we got to go away here okay. for a minute, right? Go ahead. All right, folks, we're just going to take another quick break here. We'll be back in a few minutes. You're listening to Potapalooza 2008 live on EAA Radio. Hi, right, welcome back once again to Potapalooza 2008 live on EAA Radio. I got to say, one, one of my favorite characters in uh, that other Hangar Talk podcast uh, is Dave Higdon, who has a wonderful sense of humor and has been uncharacteristically quiet here tonight. So. I'm going to toss it down to Dave because Dave's been coming here for a long time, and I think he's probably got some wise words for us. Oh, I just wanted to follow up on where we were hanging with the Eclipse when the, when the break came. It's a couple of real quick things. One, the guy was, Vern Rayburn was a visionary, and his vision is going to be with us for the rest of aviation history because that company invented, established a new category of aircraft that's picked up with others, such as the Cessna Mustang. Two, you can't run a company where all the products going out the door are already in need of warranty work. <laughs> that God knows when that's going to happen. They've got over 200 airplanes out there, none of which are finished. They all have to come back to be updated at one level or another. Lighten into known icing. Well, they just started putting that on the production line. All those airplanes out there have to come back to be refitted. IFR, GPS, and WASS. It's not any any of them. It's just starting down the line. They all have to come back to be refitted. At some point, that equation had to change. But the fact is that the guy did have a vision that really struck a chord in the community. I never really bought into the idea that the Eclipse was going to be a commercial success as a, as a, as a charter airplane. I still think that the owner pilot is going to be the salvation of that operation. But uh, the guy had a, had a great idea. He carried it for 11 years and got it a long way. And, and the irony is that what 
in the end bought him was how much more, how much oversold it was and ultimately under delivered. And you just couldn't keep saying, we're still going to be the greatest in the world. We're still going to teach the world how to build airplanes the right way. When you got 220 of them out there that are still wrong. So it's, 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 they're going to get it fixed. They may not be selling 500 a year like we were told so many years ago, but they're going to be there. They're going to be established, and hopefully they'll throttle back on the 400 and let the 500 get to prime time before they start pushing the new idea for the next product. That's all I was going to. And I'll save the really funny stuff for something really funny. I was going to say, really that funny. wasn't funny at all. <laughs> <laughs> There's not a beer in your hand down there, is there, Dave? Sorry? There's not a beer in your hand, is there? Do we need to That's give you some part of the problem. <laughs> well, as long as we're in not funny mode, uh, let's, let's do some a serious discussion, something that has been on my mind, other than these high fuel prices, and we know that costs of everything else in, in terms of our aircraft owning and aircraft flying are going up. As I was driving in here, there was a story that uh, somebody is suing the EPA to force them to regulate the greenhouse gas emissions of aircraft. I gathered they were particularly blaming airliners. But you can see those of us that were flying in 9-11 or trying to fly after 9-11, the day could come when we actually are outlawed. And, and I think I can see the day could come uh, maybe in 15 years when, when none of these piston planes can fly anymore because we can't get av gas. So, I mean, are you, do you think that we'll work our way out of these things? Do we have a future 20 years from now or whatever? Absolutely. Because, yeah. for one thing, the EPA isn't regulating greenhouse gases anywhere else yet. Uh, so there's a whole lot of industry out there ahead of us. I mean, the, what, what they've been regulating all these years hasn't changed. And the greenhouse gas equation, they lost a court decision that said they got to do something, which they still haven't. So there's a lot of bigger users in line ahead of us. Maybe a bigger worry is the future supply of 100 low lead. And there's some hope that something will come along that will be carbon neutral, sustainable, and competitively priced. Because we're such a tiny blip in the market that it's not going to take tens of billions of gallons a year to do that. It's going to take a few hundred million gallons a year to do that and switch us over. But it's another instance where, you know, yell and fight like hell and we'll be able to sustain ourselves long term. Because there's way too much horsepower behind a lot of bigger users of GA for it to go down. I mean, think about the amount of money invested in business jet hardware here, and they're they're on that bullseye as well as us. Right, and you know that's that's kind of where I go with it is that um, as it becomes more and more of a pinch, I have so much faith in the people that are involved in the aviation community that I I really believe and I have faith that people will come out of the woodwork and solve this problem as fast as you need the gas, as fast already, as you need whatever you need. Jason's absolutely right. For example, we already have a. Uh, alternative fuel standard, the, the 96 UL standard, on, on which probably 70% of the GA piston fleet can operate reliably and legally and safely. It's that remaining 30% um, that there's, there's really no good solution for. Um, the, there's reduced power takeoffs, there's uh, re reducing the possibility of detonation in those engines. And there, there will be a solution forthcoming. I don't know what it is. I, I can't tell you when. But if you look around the grounds here uh, and you see the innovation and the imagination that people bring to this avocation, uh, come away with a great deal of confidence that this problem will get resolved. You know, um, Jeb, there's something that you said there about reduced power takeoffs that I just wanted to comment on. And... Um... I suppose I, I should preface this by saying anybody who listens to my show knows I, I'm a firm believer in safety and safe practices and flying safely. But uh, I will say I was standing at San Carlos Airport the other evening watching a Mooney Acclaim take off, and it drew my attention, not because it was loud, but because I couldn't really hear it. And I was watching it roll down the one runway, and it, we're less than 3,000 feet of runway at San Carlos, and this thing just kind of lifted off the ground, got up on the downwind, and that's when I heard the power, or the pilot put the power to the engine. And I thought, wow, that's really interesting. You know, we can be more courteous neighbors, certainly not if you need the power, and always keep your hand on it if and when you do. But if you're flying solo in a high-performance airplane like a Mooney, why put the pedal to the metal for takeoff? Well, I, anything like that, of course, obviously has to be done with safety in mind. If you're operating um, from a 5,000-foot runway in a high-performance single, 
No, you don't need to use full power for your takeoff. Shorter runways, uh, yeah. You let's let's uh, be let's think about this a little bit before uh, we go sailing off the end of the runway at, at forty-five knots. There, there's 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 a there's a time and a place for everything. Agreed. I think there's still yet to be some research done in that because by climbing faster, you're also going to reduce your noise signature. So it, it may be noisier in the cockpit, but it may be quieter on the ground. So, you know, you may not be doing as much. And of course, you, you know what a Mooney is supposed to sound like when it takes off. Yes, I do. <laughs> you no, have I'm... to ask the neighbors if they really notice the, dif- the difference, too. Well, you know, and, and where I am in California, we're dealing with an extremely noise-sensitive situation. I mean, there's literally a city uh, council member who lives off the end of the runway and works from home and is the first to pick up the phone anytime there's any kind of noise abatement violation. Um, I guess I was inspired by the fact that some pilot was thinking of it. And I think, again, back to the community, I have total faith in pilots and their ability to think straight and to do the right thing. And um, it was just nice to know that somebody was working on our team. And as far as general aviation kind of coming back and uh, innovating to solve our problems, uh, has anyone seen Swift Fuels here? I'm not sure if they're here. Anyone familiar with them? They're coming up with some sort of new fuel, and of course, we all know how marketing speak goes, but it's supposed to be cheaper and able to replace 100 low lead with no modifications at all. And I'm crossing my fingers that they can actually do that and get what, it right. What is, and it's not a petroleum-based fuel? It's, they won't reveal their process. From what I understand, they take ethanol and uh, they do something to it. I believe it's another biological process. That something magic. about drunk algae, but <laughs> it's lining. It's corporate magic. It's linies. That's what it is. <laughs> Don't spread that around. Now. It would be the uh, <laughs> the fuel of the Northwoods. Oh, there's yeah, some work being done. There's some work being done with algae, for example. It creates an oil-like product, and when the algae creates this oil-like product that can be refined into a fuel, guess what it does? It takes carbon dioxide out of the air. It's completely neutral. The, the nice yeah. thing about that, too, is that uh, there's a lot of places to grow algae that don't take away from our food crops. Oh, then none of it takes away from the food crop, and they're building these, ver- these walls these vertical cells to multiply the sunlight exposure that it takes to make the algae grow. So you're not talking about hundreds of square miles of ponds that, you know, make the neighbors kind of want you to move, but buildings with solar, with clear panel and all these cells vertically aligned and they pump the fluid through it. They pull the oil off. They refine it. It's burnable. It returns the carbon dioxide to the air. It takes it back out again. I can't recall the name of the company that's working on that, but I believe it's out of California. And it was the first, it was the first press release I saw on alternative fuels that actually caught my attention. And I thought, oh, this sounds like something. Well, there's that some work, there's some work being done at Purdue University in Indiana that uh, is specifically directed at replacing 100 low lead. Uh, yeah, I believe that was the Swift Fuels thing is the, the company that I've heard of that's working on that. Yeah. Since we're talking about such a small volume, relatively speaking, they've been talking numbers two to three years to get it to a, a uh, production level. Wouldn't it be cool if their research resulted in a carbon neutral fuel for all piston GA airplanes? That would just be you not know, my socks off. And of course, then with we the have algae, another I... reason for people to fly. Hey, right. it's carbon neutral. It's environmentally hey, friendly. Where should fly? <laughs> and I believe I'm, the I'm, term they're using I'm is carbon. green I just, fruit. Actually, I decided I'm carbon positive, and so are these two guys. We all fly wood gliders. <laughs> okay. Before my glider was a glider, it was a tree. <laughs> okay. Well, they're, they're... Well, that's about like one too, right? Yeah, just about, but. <laughs> We, so we'd like to, I'm still ahead of we'd the like to, We'd like to see funding go into a program that converts hot air out of the beltway into aviation fuel. <laughs> I, th- I thought you were, uh, I was waiting for hot Before air. Before my plane, airplane so. was an airplane, it was beer cans. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, as far as the, the health of GA in general, I was kind of afraid that this show was going to maybe be a little small this year, that we maybe weren't going to have people here. but. It appears people are saying, you know, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. You can charge us $6 a gallon. We're going to fly. It's what we do. Um, 
I was very happy. I, I, I kind of judge the, the health of what's going on by where I end up in the North 40 when I come in here at about 10 minutes to 8 on Sunday night every year. And a couple years ago, I was in row 543 over by the shower building. Last year, I was over by the Hilton. And I went, you know, where am I going to be this year? And it's, it's kind of a little hard to judge because they did block off a couple of small areas due to soft ground. I ended up, well, after being in 543 two years ago and 574 last year, I was in 580 this year. And I think that that's probably equal to where I was last year if you uh, consider those, those uh, mud-prone areas. But uh, I was very happy to see that. So I think we're doing all right. I think we do need to, you know, buckle down a little bit. There, there are some problems to be solved. We, we, but, we're it's, reserving it's space for right? you in row 610 next year, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 my, that, does, that row does exist, doesn't it? <laughs> to, to, my, my concern, to, to wrap this up, my concern is, I mean, we can, we can guess that in terms of um, automobiles, you know, maybe you, if, you had, if you couldn't get petroleum gas anymore, then you wouldn't see 25-year-old cars in the street. Everybody would be driving electric cars or whatever else. We're not going to be driving electric planes. So we do have to solve this, and, and that's just... My, my only thought was we can just hope that by that point the price of aluminum is so high that we can get our money back. I, I don't know. <laughs> Once all the real innovators can't fly anymore because they can't get gas, we'll, we'll get some quick answers. Yeah. Maybe we'll, we'll yeah. have electric planes. Well, if there's, anything, Jeff, that's, you were, you if there's right. anything that's going to do us under, it's us evaporating. Because the biggest problem this community faces, it's been my long contention, is that we're not growing more of us at a rate fast enough to replace the ones that go away. And we could, you know, look at an Oshkosh 50 years, 60 years down in the future and say, what a great crowd. All 473 pilots in the country showed up. If we don't do something to stop preaching to the choir and start expanding the choir and make this, uh, make this little cathedral a lot bigger, because there's power in numbers, there's lower cost in numbers, there's safety in numbers, and our numbers keep going the wrong way. Well, the, you know, a major you know, factor there, as, you know, as Tom said, is that EAA, when EAA was founded, they were all lot World War II veterans, and we've had military veterans all along. And unfortunately, those heroes are, are, are not going to be with us much longer. So it's, there's going to be a major drop in the, uh, the population of pilots just because that big bubble pilots is going to go away. Well, I'm going to... Here's, gonna... here's something that drives me crazy. We have companies like Cirrus and Icon who are doing exactly what they need to do for the industry to grow. And there are pilots out there who say, oh, a Cirrus isn't a real airplane. There's a parachute. A real pilot wouldn't need an airplane with a parachute. Folks, a parachute is a marketing tool as much as it is a safety tool, I think. There's a short word for those guys. Fool. Yeah. The, right. the other thing, it, it, it kind of seems like an elitist attitude. You know, if you ever say a real pilot this, a real pilot that, like Dan said something about radio control pilots a while ago and <laughs> made a lot Boy, of people we hear very mad. On, yeah, oh, we, we, got, we got letters about that one. But, <laughs> we, we you know, believe... frankly, anybody who's interested in aviation, we need to, we need to help get them in. And sometimes there are people who act a little bit elitist. Ooh, I'm a pilot and you're not. Next time you see somebody at the FBO and they're not necessarily talking to somebody and they don't look like they know what's going on, go talk to them. See if they're interested. Bring them in. That is what's going to save GA. Yeah, I, I, would, I want to add to that since I'm a brand new pilot. Um, I, I've recently gone through this. I started my training about four months ago. And um, it's not... It's not, I've been interested in aviation all my life, and I'm a pretty um, outgoing guy. And it wasn't the easiest thing in the world to go into these FBOs and, uh, you know, just walk in and say, hey, I want to I know about learning to fly. I want to talk to some instructors. I want to, you know, I, I want to find out how you guys do this and, and what your program's like. That's not the easiest thing in the world to do. And so I would like to challenge the, the general aviation community to, Reach out to your friends that even might have a, a, a small inkling. Introduce them to people at the FBOs. Take them flying, and instead of just going to rent the plane and picking them up at the ter terminal, why don't you walk them through the flight school? You know, why don't you introduce them to your instructor or a couple of instructors? 
and and that sort of thing. And I, I think that alone will go a long ways to introducing people in a way that's not, um, you know, so um, intimidating. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, the FBOs are their own worst enemy in, in a lot in a lot of senses, um, and we've talked about this on on UCAP before. We'll we'll talk about it again. Some people are seeing the light. Uh, some people are understanding that the guy who who drives up in a fifty thousand dollar Lexus uh, and climbs into a hundred thousand dollar airplane is looking for you know a clean seat and and clean windows, and he's looking for good quality training materials. And a host of other uh, accoutrements to which he's become accustomed. I believe and, it was Dave Higdon who said air conditioning and cup holders, well, right? Exactly. <laughs> I said air conditioning. He said cup holders. Well, um, but it, air conditioning would go a long, long way to making that environment much more hospitable to that guy driving up in the fifty thousand dollar Lexus. Certainly, uh, general aviation has done, uh, I, I believe, a terrible job of marketing itself and being incredibly exclusive of people. And I've heard stories from so many people, not so recently, who've gone to an FBO and tried to kind of sign up for lessons and sort of, well, you're not cool enough to be uh, to join our ranks and sort of get sent away. I'm glad to see that seems to be changing somewhat. My question now, the other end of, of the FBO equation, now we're seeing the jet centers and as I travel around the country, it's not unusual to feel a little slighted because I'm not buying 500 gallons of Jet A. We don't have a place for you on the ramp. We try not to give those places any of our business. We really do. Now, in some, some places, you don't have the option. That's but a lot of places, I'd rather take a 30-minute cab ride farther than that jet center and land at some place a little more out of the way and a little more hospitable. You, you know, uh, particularly with the uh, higher price that they, they gig you for for Avgas. Talked to a guy a few months ago. It's one of the reasons I got on this affordable flying bent uh, that, that's got me sucked into speaking tomorrow. Uh, went to the local FBO, wanted to take flying lessons. Oh, sure. You know, he's, he makes about $40,000, $45,000 a year. He's got a blue-collar job. He's always wanted to fly. He sees this new light sports stuff. Oh, we don't dabble in that. We teach in these. Oh, they're new G1000 equipped Cessna 172s. They only rent for $125 an hour. So you're going to need about seven or $8,000 to get your ticket, plus you're going to need about $1,500 worth of materials and the headsets and the handheld. Uh, and then you can rent this airplane for $125 an hour wet, and if you're really interested, we can sell it to you for three hundred grand. And the guy went out of there and said, "Who in the hell are they talking to?" When he could have gone to the uh, the little country airport about fifteen miles away, talked to an instructor that's going to charge him thirty five dollars an hour, rent him a one seventy two for seventy five dollars an hour. It's not going to have a G Wiz G one thousand in it. But you know what? That, that's not what he's going to be buying anyway. Then that FBO could help him get into an airplane for fifteen or twenty thousand dollars. It will get him started down the road. And that kind of person, if they get the segue, if they get the entry, if they get to the feeling welcome, if they get the opportunity, that could grow up to be the guy that buys that three hundred thousand dollar airplane someday. But he's not starting out that way. You know, along those lines, I think that we all need to get behind the sport pilot certificate. Yeah, well, I think we all you know, are. Yeah, and definitely. we all are. And that's the, the really cool thing to see. I mean, companies like Cessna with the Skycatcher and the whole host of others are putting big muscle behind getting that message out to pilots. And Skycatcher made a whole lot of other flight schools set up and take notice because they were already blowing these off as not really worth their time. They don't have the margin and anybody that, you know, can't afford to do it the full boat way. Do we really want them as a customer? That's not an overt statement. But it is an existing it, attitude. Right, and it's the wrong way to really sell it. I mean, the, the sport pilot certificate is just the entry. It's just the door, and then you keep That's right. That's why the they right made direction. all that time eligible to count toward more stuff. Absolutely. You know, and I think we all have to get over the experience we had with the recreational pilot certificate. This is not that. This is now you got totally my going. different. <laughs> General <laughs> Aviation used to have a program in the 70s called Learn to Fly. No, I wanted they it. They sent people oh, around the country. Jeff story. <laughs> then we had be a pilot. Well, Je Jeb, I, when be a help pilot out here, started Jeb, we getting don't have really effective, the they whole started LTS to get story. tired of it. <laughs> We're actually just about done with our allotted time here, folks, on EAA Radio. I'll ask you. <laughs> we will do so, it another sorry, time. Sorry, Dave. 
come, come to dinner. I want to hear it. But <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you you heard the, the the sentiment from all of us, folks. Everyone in this room, everyone out there on the grounds and surrounding the grounds who's listening to EAA radio, everybody who's streaming over the Internet right now, everybody who's going to download this episode in the future as a podcast, all of you, go out, find some people, take them to the airport, show them how fun this is, see how many more people we can bring into this. Well, tell them that, 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 now, that, that the, new, uh, the new AOPA website is gofly.com, or is it... Uh... But it, the AOPA has got another campaign to actually get people. Just take your friends okay. flying and encourage them. So we'll you know, give that from Tell them to go I'm flying sure because fly. time spent flying is not subtracted from your That's lifespan. That's absolutely all right? right. And with that, one thing that we didn't mention before uh, for the people who aren't familiar, both Jason Miller and Steve Tupper are very talented musicians. And uh, as is tradition for our Potapalooza, we're gonna we're gonna use Jason's closing theme to take us out here. Take it away, Jason. Look into the sea, and there you are. Look into the sea. Tropical sun through the ripple in blue. I look into the sea, and there you are. I look on to the land, and there you are. Look on to the land, and there you are. Moving with the shadows in the alleyways, the city. Lights, diamonds in the Milky Way. I look on to the land, and there you are. I look up in the sky, and there you are. I look up in the sky, and there you are. You're floating like an angel on the airwaves, you're falling like a raven in the afternoon haze look up in the sky and there you are thank you all thanks everybody for coming all right folks thanks for joining us thanks to Farid over at EAA radio for having us live Enjoy the rest of the show here at Oshkosh. I believe the radio station's going to cut over to the Lieutenant Dan Band. Lots of other stuff going on out around the grounds. We'll be here if you want to chat with us off the microphone. Thanks for coming. All right. Well, that does it for Potapalooza 2008. I hope you enjoyed that uh, broadcast and uh, these two episodes on the Student Pilot Cast. Please give me any feedback that you would like, any uh, ideas for future episodes or anything you'd like to talk to me about. You can reach me at bill at studentpilotcast.com or you can use the contact link on the website at www.studentpilotcast.com. Thanks again for listening, everybody, and stay tuned for some more coverage of Oshkosh as well as some of my uh, regular episodes. We'll see you all soon. Music for today's audio cast is the song To Be an Angel from the great Canadian band Uncle Seth. You can get more information and subscribe to the Student Pilot audio cast using iTunes, Zoom, or any other podcatcher at www.studentpilotcast.com.